Okay, a good half hour has passed with me screwing around with this dumb thing. And this thing is that tube that I hinted about back a couple of videos ago. It is a Tektronix T7610, an electron bombardment semiconductor. And, well, it is what the name implies. It is a train wreck of vacuum tube technology and semiconductor technology. And, uh... Kind of a strange device. These things have kind of been around. They were always a very much a niche item in, in electronics. I think there might still be a few applications for these, but they never really took off. If there was ever a heyday, it was the late 70s, early 80s. Now, looking up with uh, the patents and such like that, a little hard to pin down who actually invented this. I see... Patents going all the way back to the 50s and the 60s and 70s. I see patents from Philips, Watkin Johnson, Tektronix, the U.S. Army. Hard to say. But probably back in the 50s when semiconductor physics was getting established, some of the vacuum tube guys thought, hey, what happens if we shoot electrons at this? Well, <laughs> this is one of the results. Now this is a very interesting device. It is actually an 8-bit analog to digital converter. That's right, analog to digital converter, an 8-bit tube. And this was part of a Tektronix product called a 7612, which was uh, a sampling system. Now, uh, the thing is with this is it was at the time, 1980, it was far better than uh, semiconductors or uh, analog to digital. This thing, believe it or not, back in 1980, could do 80 mega samples per second real time with 8 bits of resolution. The tube itself is got, has got a uh, 200 megahertz bandwidth, but as we know with sampling and the math involved, you're not going to get that. You, the, the, your sample rate and your bandwidth aren't going to match. You, you, you need, you know, what, uh, officially double or whatever, but, you know, more like triple the, the, uh, uh, um, the bandwidth compared to the uh, uh, sample rate. So uh, let's take a look at this thing. It is interesting. It is very clever, I've got to say. One end, we have a pretty standard electron gun, very typical Tektronics. Um, and, uh, basically you, you make a beam and we can see here, let's get that wire out of the way a little bit. So let's move it like that. That's a little better. I think, uh, all sorts of acceleration, elect uh, uh, electrodes. You can see here some of the high voltage, which there are a couple of them here, high voltage, uh, for acceleration, some very interesting, uh, structures here. And what's happening is it's, the beam is getting shaped into a, more or less a ribbon, a flat sheet. Now there are deflection plates in here. There are actually two sets of deflection plates. There's an XY deflection plate system. Uh, it's a little hard to tell exactly where it is, but it's not that important. Its only use is to get the beam centered. Um, because you need a very precise beam. We've got here a coil, which... It might be a focus or might be for a rotation. It's a little hard to say. Um, but then it gets starts to get very interesting up here. The beam, as I said, gets turned into a sheet. And if I lift it up, and hopefully you can see that right in here, there's an electrode, another one of those crosses, with a slit, a horizontal slit. And uh, what's happening is that's forming, that's the final forming of the beam into this very thin ribbon. Then you can see there are a couple of deflection plates. Now this is another set of deflection plates, but you don't get a complete pair. You only get, well, one set of deflection plates. So you can only move this ribbon, this sheet, in, well, let's just say the y-axis. Over here, underneath here, and unfortunately really can't see anything going on, there's a semiconductor target. 
It's actually a, 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 a bit of wafer, a die, that has, well, it's essentially an integrated circuit. Now, how this thing works is extremely clever. And I'll need to get a, uh, make a little drawing for you here. Make some room here. Go the way, you. Okay, let's draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are our bit positions. And that goes all the way up to 256 because, like I said, this is an 8-bit device. And we'll just put some bars here to show the... make things a little clearer. Now, the wafer has a bunch of diodes. They're reverse biased. And uh, one of the things about electron bombardment semiconductors is if uh, you, you reverse bias the diodes, if you shoot electrons at them, well, they'll start conducting all of a sudden. And the way this works is on the wafer, let's just say that's kind of the wafer here, we start putting diodes down. Yeah, I got them pretty straight there. Now, let's say this, this is our beam here, the ribbon, and we can deflect it through those that second pair of deflection plates in the Y direction. And yeah, it goes all the way across. Like I said, it's a ribbon, it's a sheet. As it hits the die, if, say, the deflection plates have zero voltage on them because, well, there's no signal, it's down here at the zero value. If we give a little juice, a little voltage to the deflection plates, the, uh, the uh, beam will start deflecting. The ribbon will start deflecting up and down. Now, if you notice, on the zero position, there are no diodes, no signal, no, no logical output. None, there's no diodes to turn on. If we give it a little bit of voltage, that beam will hit one diode. That diode will turn on. Give it a little more, another diode will turn on. Get it go up a little bit more, well, one of the diodes turns off, but it's a different diode. Go a little bit more, and a diode will turn on. And a little bit more, and so on, all the way up to the, the, the greatest value, which is up here at 256. No, I'm not going to draw them all. If you notice, this is a gray code. Only one bit position changes per unit. Or per, per, per position, I should say. This is just like on a mechanical rotary encoder. A gray code is used to take out ambiguity. So those, those little sections where in between, say, you know, the beam is right here, or right here, or right here. You don't want a place where there are sort of two bit positions competing for the signal. And, you know, maybe just a little bit of noise will make one of them bounce up and down. You'll get uncertainty. So a gray code will kind of very much cut down that uncertainty. And uh, you'll very much more be certain where you are, and in this case, where the ribbon is along the wafer. Now, no doubt there's a little bit of uh, demultiplexing happening on the wafer here, in there, uh, because, well, as you can see, there are just not enough pins not enough pins on that to, to bring out every diode individually. So there's a little bit of, I think it's ECL, 100K ECL, uh, integrated circuits logic, basically probably demultiplexers and things like that, to spit out the gray code out of those pins. It's then shoved into memory. I guess it's probably converted into standard binary at some, binary at some point. Shoved into memory, you fill up the memory. Now on the 7612, I think you only got 2K or 4K. You didn't get much. Uh, but then again, ECL memory, I don't know, you know, it's kind of obsolete now, but wow, that was that stuff was expensive, especially the 100K. Uh, remember, 100K logic, the just the glue chips were about seven bucks a piece as compared to, let's say, CMOS 7400 series. It was what, 20 cents a piece or something like that? Anyway. So, yes, this thing, you could move this ribbon up and down, 
turn off uh, turn on diodes turn off diodes depending on where that sheet that ribbon fell figure out which uh, you know uh, the the digital logic uh, uh, the signal coming out which which bits were on which bits were off that would digitize your analog signal and of course tektronics you know what were they very good at they were very good at handling very fast uh, high bandwidth um, uh, analog signals in their deflection amps so that's how this thing managed to get such high performance in the 80s now this product i think only lasted uh until about 1988 because let's face it this this technology was sort of doomed um you know semiconductor analog to digital chips were you know they they, they were advancing so fast at that point that yeah the, the, this thing could, couldn't compete because i don't even want to know i should perhaps dig up an old tektronics catalog and see if i could find what the the price of this tube it must have been hideously expensive look at the construction just just it's amazing a huge amount of work went into these tubes and then yeah i got to think the, all uh, aligning everything at this end was probably extremely difficult so yeah by the 1980 uh, late 80s th these things were kind of still in the catalogs but i bet you tech wasn't wasn't selling too many of them i actually had a 7612 a long long time ago someone at the mit flea gave to me uh, i think i got rid of it at some point uh didn't really know what to do with it um well somewhere i i glommed on to a tube here and here it is so uh yeah very interesting device and uh now the support electronics to this thing must have been hideous in fact i do remember uh, looking at the 7612 thinking wow there's a lot to this because remember the beam has to be extremely precise let's get this diagram back it has to be very flat and has to be extremely horizontal because if there's any sort of skewing curving bumps in it whatever gets too thick it may hit diodes it's not supposed to Imagine this is a little exaggerated, but imagine your your beam is going like this or maybe like this It's going to hit turn on diodes. It's not really meant to and You're not going to get an accurate accurate uh, Basically conversion into digital So there you have it a bizarre tube. It's probably Probably one of my most recent tubes in my collection. It falls out of my uh, collection scope a little bit Um I may I may pass it on at some point. I don't know. It is kind of neat, but as as you know, I'm I'm more of a 30s, 40s, 50s tube guy, mostly 30s actually, but they didn't have stuff like this back in the 1930s. Um so yeah, a neat tube. Uh that's about what I know about it. It is just a fantastic device. And uh, an 8-bit analog to digital converter in a vacuum with an IC built in. All right. Well, uh, if any of you guys know anything more about this device, um, there is information on the web. Uh, you can you can find all the all the uh, academic papers about EBSs and things like that. And one of them actually does mention this device. Um, yeah, leave a comment or so if you ever used one of these things or a, a T seventy six twelve. Let me know. And, uh, hey, if you like the video, leave a like, maybe, uh, maybe subscribe, maybe look at some of the past videos. I uh, got stuff about a lot more weird old tubes, uh, old mainframe stuff, uh, old military, com uh, uh, radios from the thirties, wide range of things. Okay. Well, hope you like this and, uh, I shall talk to you later. Bye-bye.